Yeah, good morning again. Good to see uh, lots of people. And it's just a pleasure to always bring God's word to you guys. So, um, yeah, today we want to continue uh, in the book of Nehemiah. So, the last few weeks we've been looking at time to review. So, uh, we've been emphasizing the need to think about rebuilding society. So, Nehemiah presents a, a clear picture of how that may be done. So the first five chapters have looked at different aspects of Nehemiah's journey. And today we want to go to Nehemiah 6 uh, to see what transpired in Nehemiah 6. So today I'll be looking at facing oppositions and finishing strong. That would be the subject of our contemplation today, facing oppositions and finishing strong. Uh, now, I love Nehemiah because it, it, it shows us a lot of things that we can apply to our lives. And I hope that as we go through this today, you will be encouraged and, and be blessed uh, as we uh, delve deeper into Nehemiah 6. So, if you've got your Bible, can you turn to Nehemiah 6 for me, and I will read, and then I'll pray. I'm quite pleased that there's not a lot of um, tricky names uh, in Nehemiah 6. So, um, unlike when Duncan did the, I think it was Nehemiah 2 or 3, it was, I think 3, I think it was uh, lots of names. Uh, but there's still a few tricky ones there, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Okay, so Nehemiah 6. Um, yeah, on the screen. So Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors in the gate. So Sambalat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them on one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Samuel's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There's a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me that it is true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to this report, you plan to be their king, he also reports that you have appointed prophet in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there's a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there's no truth in any part of your story. You're making up this whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagine it that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Delahiah, and grandson of Meitabel, who was confined to his home. He felt he was in lockdown. He said, <coughs> let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the door shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, should somebody in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I wouldn't do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because the, the, Tobiah and Samuel had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Remember, oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sambalat have done. And remember Noadiah the prophet, and all the prophets like R who have tried to intimidate me. So on October 2nd, the world was finished. Just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. During those 52 days, many letters went, went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. For many in Judah sworn allegiance to him because his father-in-law, 
was Shechaniah, son of Hara, and his son Jehohanah was married to the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. They kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds and that they told him everything I said. And Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. Lord, we just thank you for your word today. Lord, I just, I just ask that the entrance of your word will bring light to your people. I don't know what you're going to do today, but I just trust the Holy Spirit, you will move mightily in our midst today. And at the end, your name alone will be glorified. Lord, this vessel oh, I present to you, O oh God, use me as a vessel unto honor in your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. In his goal of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, Nehemiah had to stand up the violent threats of the enemy. Uh, two Sundays ago, Duncan dealt with the first part of the opposition, chapter 4. Because this feels like the same thing that happened in chapter 4. And if, you have, if you have not listened to that message, I will urge you to listen to that message. Because he spoke more about what happened uh, when they began to build and how the opposition started. Now you might have to deal with the internal conflict between the wealthy and the poor Jews. So last week we began to look at the, the conflict between the nobles and, and the poor Jews and how uh, that transpired. Now, at this stage it's almost done. But the bridges in the wall have been repaired. The wall is complete, except for the doors in the gate. But the enemy has not given up. You know, the enemy strikes back. You know, it feels like, you know, looking at the, the Star Wars franchise, you know, the enemy strikes back. You know, in chapter 4, they've tried. And now they're back in chapter 6. They're striking back. They won't give up. I mean, this is amazing because if you read chapter 4, you think by, that, by the time you get to chapter 6, that the enemy will be saying, look, we've tried everything, and now we give up. But the enemy never gives up, does he? And then he comes back in chapter 6 with even greater determination. And it is amazing what happened and how Nehemiah dealt with this. And as we talked about building society, how do we deal with opposition in our lives? When you're faced with challenges every day, what do you do? And what did Nehemiah, what did Nehemiah do? And how can we apply what he's done into our lives? So the first thing I want to look at today is great work and great opposition. So I'm looking at four key things very quickly. Uh, great work and great opposition. That'll be the first thing I want to look at today. So in the first few verses, the Bible talks about, you know, the enemies of Israel trying to intimidate Nehemiah from stopping the work. Okay, now, if you look at chapter 2, that's so, so Sambalat and Geshen sent a message asking me to meet them in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Now, if you look at verse 3, he said, I reply by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Great works attract great opposition. There is an enemy that never gives up. No matter who you are, the accuser never gives up. If you look at Revelation, the Bible says that the accuser of our brethren, you know, accuses them day and night. You know, Job, in the Bible, the Bible talks about Job being a man that was upright before God, and the enemy was accusing Job before God. The enemy never gives up. But what Nehemiah was doing, he was engaged in a great work. Nehemiah was engaged in something that kept him focused all the time. And that's the first challenge for us this morning. That when we are faced with accusation, when we are faced with opposition, God demands of us that there's something he has committed to our hand that we have got to do. Because when you're focused on something, you realize that when opposition comes, you know, it doesn't really affect you much because you are focused on something. And that was when Nehemiah said, I am engaged in a great work. I cannot come down. Why should I stop what God has committed to my hand? And my first challenge to us today is, what has God committed to your hand? What are you doing? What are you doing? There's a place in the Bible where um, somebody was asked to look after something, and the Bible said it was going here and there, and the person left. Because when you are focused on what God has committed to your hand, 
then when opposition comes, you are able to manage it properly. Nehemiah was given a great work, and he felt like this is what God has committed to my hand, and I cannot leave it because I want to miss somebody. And guess what? They asked him to come to the plain of Ono. Now, Ono is 20 miles away from where he was. And Nehemiah said, no, I'm not going to stop and leave what God has committed to my hand just to meet you. No, I am going to focus on what God has given to me. Now, do you know what God has called you into? You know, Ephesians 2, Bible says that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has prepared for us that we should work it. So every single person, if you're listening to me today, God has placed in your hand a great work. Now, your work doesn't have to be the work of preaching. I mean, when we look at Ephesians, uh, Nehemiah 3, when they were building the different walls, the Bible talks about the, the different gate, the ship gate. The, there were different gates that everybody committed to build. So God has given us something. There's something in your hand. And my question to you today, have you found what God has committed to your hand? What is the great work that God has committed to your hand? When Jesus came, he said, to this hand was I born. And for this cause came I into the world. Jesus didn't just come into the world to just see. He came for a purpose. One John said, for this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest. That he might destroy the works of the enemy. So when Jesus showed up, he showed up with a purpose in his heart. My question to us today, what is your purpose in life? Why are you living? It sounds like, a, like a, a, a stupid question. But have you discovered purpose? Have you discovered why? Why? Why am I leaving? What's the purpose of my life? Why am I still alive today? I ask myself every day. Because when you understand purpose, it drives your passion. When you understand why you're living, it fills you. You, you. you know that the reason why you're doing what you're doing is because there's a higher purpose to it. Oh, when Joseph was in the prison... Oh, he got to the palace. But the reason why God took him all through the journey was for him to preserve Israel. Because the time will come that his, his brothers will come from Israel. They will come to Egypt and there will be no food in their land. And Joseph was there to preserve Israel. So friends, when God shows up, it's because he has given you a great work. And please do not think for a second that, oh, I've got nothing to do. In a few weeks ago, when Donga spoke about, you know, we have different things in church and all that, uh, somebody said afterward that, well, what about those people that don't want to do any work? I'm like, yes, we are not saying that people should do work. But I, I, I believe with the whole of my heart that every single person has something to offer. Even a smile. I see Andy smiling at me. That is, even, that is all you offer. I'm fine with it. Every single person has something to offer. There's nobody that God has not given something. The Bible talks about the talent, the five, the two, the one. The one that had one buried it and did nothing. The one that had to win and produce two more. Five different talent God has given us. We cannot afford to just sit down. You know, I feel like, you know, I could just, I don't want to be doing this preaching because this is not my day job. But I take it upon myself that God, no, God wants to use me for his glory. And I'm going to step out and I'm going to take it. I am going to do all I can. I'm going to study. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to help me when I stand before God's people to bring a word. There is nothing that God cannot do if we set our heart to do it. Oh, there was a man in the Bible called Moses. The Bible calls him a stammerer. Can you believe that God called a stammerer? Oh, of all the people, God called a stammerer to lead his people. Uh, I, 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 I can't talk, Lord. And God said, no, no. Oh, there's a man called Gideon. The Bible said that he was a list. He said, no, I can't do this. He kept testing God. And God said, I'm going to use you. It doesn't matter. Oh, there was a man called David. Oh, he was just a young lad. And he killed the Goliath of this world. When you have a lot of armies, it, God used them mightily. God has given us a great work. Nehemiah realized that 
That was a great work that God has committed to his hands. And I'm just holding you today. Don't feel that you cannot offer anything. There's so much in you that God has given to you. Only if you allow that to find expression. You know, only, you know. And some of you may not know, actually, I, 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 and as I said this to myself, actually, I'm a great actor. I used to act. You know, but I, I realized that I stopped acting because I felt like I don't want to do it anymore. But little surprise, when I get into my lessons, and I realize now that actually I'm an actor in my lesson because you cannot, if you come to my lesson, you'll be surprised how animated, I mean, you, I mean, you, you see what I'm doing now anyway. You, see, you, know, you know, when I'm teaching, my goodness, I'm, because obviously I teach science, so you, you've got to even be more, you know, animated with what you're doing. You know, but I realized that I cannot hold back what God has given to me. I'm, you, that thing is finding expression in something else. So I'm not on stage acting today, but wherever I go, whatever I do, I'm trying to use what God has given to me to find expression in different settings. So if yours is writing, my goodness, take the pen, start writing. If it's writing music, come on, start doing it. Whatever God has given to you, you need to use it for his glory. And that is what Nehemiah did. In spite of opposition, Nehemiah kept going. I cannot leave because God has given me a great work. No man can lead the work of God if he allows himself to be governed by what other people think. If you allow yourself to be governed by what people think, you will never start. You will never start. You know, I, I love, I love, you know, I, I always, you know, what you're passionate about, you bring to church. You know, I, I, love, I love the laws of motion. You know, the first law of motion states that every object will be in a state of rest unless an external force comes. You know, call the law of inertia. You know, everything, you guys will stay there forever, okay? The Johnny is just looking at me. Johnny will sit there. If I, Johnny actually can sit there forever. But what will make Johnny to move it's probably carrying, just giving me a nudge. She said, come on, stand up, you know, and Brad Johnny will move, you know. So everything will stay in a state of rest until something comes and forces that thing to move. Sometimes you will never do anything if you don't feel, if, if you don't trust the Lord to, like, push you up. And you need people around you to say, come on, you can do it, you know. And that will help you to move in the right direction. But also the forces around you can stop you from moving. And you need to know which one that you have around you. Otherwise, you will not be focused on what God has called you to do. Church plant is great work. We have a great church. We are coming from a church plant to a church. And God has given us a great work, and we need to realize that we are committed to what God has called us to do. Now, the second thing I want to look at very quickly is how do you undo opposition? So how did Nehemiah undo opposition? Now, you've discovered what God has called you to do. You want to do this, but how do you undo opposition? Now, in, in verse 4 to about 9, I'm not going to go back to it, but you can just, uh, I'll pick a few things there very quickly to uh, just help us to see how Nehemiah undo opposition. Now, five times the enemy came to try and distract him. And guess what he did four times? The Bible says in verse 4, four times they sent the same message. And each time I did what? I gave the same reply. Nehemiah was consistent in his answers. We see Nehemiah was very consistent in his answer. It was very clear that his intention was to stop him from doing the work. You know, same message, same answer. Same message, same answer. Four times, the same message, the same time. And I, and I remember in, in, in Matthew, Luke, and, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when Jesus was tempted of the devil, the Bible says that the first message, he said, he said uh, you know, you're hungry, you know, turn this bread. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. You see, the thing Jesus said, what eat is written. 
any time that the enemy came to tempt Jesus, the same method and was the same message. It is written. The three times that the tempter came to meet Jesus, Jesus was consistent in his answer. You know, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. Because when you are faced with opposition, we need to know what to do. And the first thing we need to do is to find consistency in the word of God. Finding consistency in the word of God. Rebuilding demands consistency. Nehemiah was consistent in his answers. We see consistency in Jesus as well. Okay? We seek consistency in Jesus' word. We must be consistent in God's word. Why is that important? Why is it important to be consistent in God's word? Because one of the greatest opposition you will face is in your mind. One of the greatest opposition you will face is in your mind. It is not the easiest, but you need to win the battles in your mind. You see, when the, what the enemy was trying to do was not to really stop Nehemiah physically, was to deal with the issues of his mind. If they can get through his mind, they can get through to Nehemiah. And how do I know? I'm going to prove this to you very quickly. If you look at Proverbs 4.23, uh, the Good News translation says, God, your life, your life is shaped by your thought. Okay, our thoughts are very important. Now let's look at a few things that the enemy tried to do. In verse 2, the Bible says that they sent words to Nehemiah. Okay? Words are products of thought. For if I'm to, I wrote this because I thought about it. Okay? Words are product of thought. In verse 5, the Bible said they sent a letter, an open letter. Now, the letter was not sealed. It was open. Now, when... Uh, ideally, when you take a letter to somebody, it is always sealed. It is only the person that can open that letter. But this letter was open. And the idea behind it was for them, for somebody to just say, okay, ah, oh, I'm going to check. What's in that letter? Oh, my goodness. Really? And then before you know it, they start spreading gossip around. That was the intention. So words, so they send an open letter to spread gossip. Now, if you look at verse 8. You know, Nehemiah said they were making up stories, inventing them out of their mind. In verse 9, you know, Nehemiah said they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining they could destroy us. In verse 12, even they, they went further as trying to give prophetic words. Prophecy should be about the mind of Christ, about something. But yet, they uttered this prophecy in their own imagination. But why? Why this tactic? Because we feed on people's opinions about us. We feed on people's opinions about the effect of social media is unprecedented. You know, you know, everything, you know, social media is such a powerful force today that everything on social media looks perfect because we want a lot of likes. If I post a picture, I mean, why would I post a picture on Facebook? Tell me, why do you post pictures on Facebook? If I, if I take a lot, I mean, you will never post a picture that is not good because you don't want people not to like it. You post pictures on Facebook, on Instagram, because you want a lot of likes. And sometimes, if you don't get likes, you feel like, wow, is it good? People don't like it. And you start thinking and thinking, you start overthinking about, oh, oh, maybe I'm too big, I'm too chubby, oh my goodness, what's going on? You know, you start, you start thinking about so many things because you want a lot of likes. We are so consummated by what people think about us. So much. That when people say something bad, it affects us deeply. And that is the strategy of these guys. They're trying to get to Nehemiah by all means. Let us spread gossip. Let's spread rumors. Let's try and get into his mind. Because if you can get into his mind, that that's it. Because when you, somebody gets into your mind, sometimes you get really fearful. You get worried. You know, you get anxious. 
you know, you, you, you start thinking a lot of, you know, I, I, I had a friend who, who had an issue in his place of work. And he was a, you know, guy was fine, everything was going on. And he had this issue. And before I knew it, he started having panic attacks. You know, at night, he couldn't sleep. You know, he lost a lot of weight. And, and I'm like, where did this come from? It came from just that single thing that happened in his place of work. And before he knew it, he was on medication. And I'm like, mate, we need to trade the source of this problem. You know, oftentimes there's always a source to everything. And if we go to the source of the problem, we are able to deal with it. And how do we deal with it? What must we do? How do you take control? I love 1 Corinthians 10. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 10 with me, I think I need to read that. 1 Corinthians 10, if you have your Bible, sorry, it's not on the screen, but I'll just read that. 1 Corinthians 10. Um, no, sorry, it's 2 Corinthians, I beg your pardon. So 2 Corinthians 10. Yeah, 1 and 2, 10, 10. But it's 2 now. So 2 Corinthians 10. You uh, said we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapon not worldly weapon, to knock down the stronghold of human reasoning and to destroy false argument. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. <clears throat> After you have become fully obedient, we'll punish everyone that remains obedient. Now, what that place is talking about is that we take captivity, every thought, to the obedience of Christ. If the enemy begins to say to you that you cannot do anything, you stand up with God's word. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you feel like giving up, he said, no, the righteous is as bold as a lion. I will not fail. I remember a time in my life where, you know, I felt there was, there was nothing much coming in. And I remember God saying to me, the, the young lion do lack and suffer hunger. But those that put their trust in the Lord will lack nothing good. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You stand up, you don't sit down. You stand up and you declare God's word over your life. Because the enemy wants you to keep, the enemy wants you to be down. And God's word is so powerful. God's word is infallible. God's word is authentic. Every word problem, there's a godly solution to it. How do I thought we had an amen there? Come on, an amen. Every worldly problem has a godly solution. Every worldly problem has a godly solution. If only you will find time to find the solution in God's word. Oh, what peace we forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. So we must feed our mind with God's word. We must take authority over the manipulations of the enemy. We must resist the devil. 1 Peter 5, 7 to 8. He said, the devil is a roaring lion looking for whom to devour. He said, you resist him steadfast in the faith. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of the Lord. How do you build your faith? By studying the word. How do you stand against the devil? By being steadfast. 1 Peter 5, 8. He said, you resist him steadfast in your faith. That is the only way to resist. The devil doesn't want you to go far in life. And I, when I was preparing for this, I just heard in my spirit that, it, that, that things that, you know, that some of us, we've, we've had these issues in our lives and we've not really gone very far because we feel like, look, there's no point trying. And when I was praying, the Holy Spirit said to me, again, from a chemistry point of view, electrons take the part of least resistance. Electrons are so amazing, they don't want to work. They will just take the part of least resistance. And sometimes some people take the part of least resistance because why, why, why stress yourself? What's the point? You know? And, and when I was talking, I was like, Rob, I, I just had this picture when I was, when I was praying that I, I, I feel that God has blessed you with so much. And, and when I was praying about it, I just felt like there was so much that, you know, God has put in your life 
And I feel like God is saying to you that, no, I want more expression. There's so much I've given to this man. And, I'm, and, and God is saying to you that, look, just take the bull by the horn. Just go for it. Whatever God has put in your heart, in your spirit, in terms of worship, in terms of every, anything else that God has committed to your hand, I, I feel God will say to you that be encouraged, just go for it. Don't hold back because there's so much potential. There's so much. I want to release my spirit upon people's life. And you will see many come to the Savior just because of what God has put in your heart. But what do you do if the enemy never gives up? I mean, what do you do? The, the third thing, now, what, what do you do if the opposition intensifies? What do you do? Because they never gave up. They kept coming back. The first thing we need to do is to pray. I'm on the third one now, to pray. So we need to pray. There's a God who will fight our battles, okay? There's a God that fights our battle. We need to pray, okay? We need to stand. In verse 11, Nehemiah said, should somebody in my position run from danger? No, I'm not going to run away. Nehemiah did not run away. Nehemiah didn't run away. <clears throat> so when we find ourselves in difficult situations, what do you do? Do you run away? Do you, you, can't, you can't run away all your life. You know, you know there's this idiom that um, let sleeping dog lie. And I always say to people, one day he's going to wake up. What will you do? You can let the sleeping dog lie forever. He can sleep. Well, he's going to wake up one day. What would you do when he does that? You've got to be ready. You can't just let things lie low. You've got to fight. And today is war. Because I, there's somebody in this place that needs to listen. That You've got to fight. Fight for everything. Life will, not have, life will not give you everything on a plate of gold. Oh, I wish. Oh, I wish I can just walk into everything. You fight your way. You, you will never. We are called. The Bible talks about we are victors. A victor is somebody that's for the battle. 1 John 5 says that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. If the, if the Bible calls it overcomers, it means that for you to overcome, you have engaged in something. You know, the Bible always talks about, you know, you know uh, no man who wants to do this will entangle himself. Because the Bible recognizes that we are called to war. There's an enemy that will not give up. So we stand, we don't run. We can't keep running all our lives. If you hold on, you will succeed. Victory goes to the man or woman who is willing to go the extra mile. When you persevere, you will come for your help. He will come to your help. The Lord will help me, the Bible says. I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know I will not be ashamed. We need to keep this up. We need to persevere. We need to work in discernment as well. How does Nehemiah or Max Shemahai as a false prophet? You know, we need to walk in discernment. If you look at verse 10 and verse 14, the Bible talks about that Nehemiah walked in discernment. Yeah, we see a man claiming to have a word from God that could save Nehemiah's life. He said, Don't say yet the Lord. Hide. But that was not what God was saying because actually, what he prophesied was not in accordance to God's word. If Nehemiah had followed his counsel, he would not have been a good leader. Even more, he would have seen. Why? If he had gone into hiding, his example of fear would have spread far among the workers. Okay? And Nehemiah was not a priest. So Nehemiah would have disobeyed God's law by going into the temple. If you go to Numbers 18, verse 7, the Bible talks about you know, what priests should do. Non-priests should flee for protection to the arms of the altar in the temple courtyard. If you go to Exodus 21, verse 4, 14, 1 Kings 1, uh, verse 50, 1 Kings 2, verse 28, it specifically talks about what non-priest should do. The non-priest should not enter the temple. Yet, the prophecy was all about going into the temple. And that is not what the Bible says non-priest should do. 
So when you get a prophetic word, you ask yourself, does it align with God's word? If it does not align with God's word, then you know that that is not a word from God. Lastly, I just want to say finishing strong. Yes, in spite of everything. In spite of the empire striking back. In spite of everything the enemy tried to do, what happened? They finished the world. The world was finished. And guess what? The world was finished in 52 days. After years of neglect, the world was finished in 52 days. But guess what Nehemiah said? He said, they finished the world. Because, look at that, they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. You will finish, you will go far, only if we, notice, we recognize that we need God's help in our lives. They finished the work because God helped them. The nations lost their confidence. When we stay, the enemy will be perplexed and lose their confidence. People will marvel at what God has done for us. Friends, I just want to close with this. That opposition doesn't have to be uh, somebody coming to you and trying to oppose you. Opposition starts in the mind. Everything the enemy was trying to do was trying to get you to Nehemiah in his mind. Because once your mind is affected, it becomes a problem. But how do we ensure that our mind is not affected by staying in God's word? By trusting God for our life. I just want to have a time of prayer for very quickly. You know, our time is fast spent. Um, and, and because God, God has given us um, prophetic word, I just want to bring prophetic pictures to one or two people very quickly as well. And um, we've got some time. We have a time of worship at the end. Um, and when I was preparing for this, um, I just heard in my spirit, uh, it was just for Kate. And, and, and I feel that on Tuesday when we, we had the prayer meeting, and it was amazing, like, uh, I think it was a statement that read what you said about uh, praying for the church and all that. And I just, I just felt something yesterday when I was praying that God has given me a burden. And, and what the enemy is trying to do is just to stop you from really fulfilling your God-given assignment. And, and I just, and I, I just had this picture that in all, the, in all this, she's more than a conqueror. That she's a fighter that will win. That she's somebody that God would take very far to show forth the manifestation of his power and his presence. You know, I, 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 I saw you like holding something, only like, like a, a sword. And as you weave the sword, things were opening. And the Bible said the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. As you stay in God's presence, I will cause doors to open. I will cause breakthroughs to happen because you are mine. And I've given you all things you need for life and for godliness. Lord, we just thank you for today. Thank you, Jesus. And I just pray for everyone under the sound of my voice who has faced opposition in life, whose mind has been affected. I just pray you encourage them today that you are there for them, that they are more than conquerors. They are victors, they are not victims. That God's hand is upon their lives. God's hand is upon their lives. That great things will burst forth in their lives, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. To the glory of your name. To the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord.